Welcome, welcome. Glad to see you all. Thank you for joining. We'll get started in just a minute or two. But in the meantime, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're from and what field you're representing today. We'd love to know who we have with us in this space. Welcome to everyone who's just joining. Glad you could be with us today. We'll get started in just a minute. Um, but in the meantime, love to have you introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know where you're from and what your field is. Welcome to those of you who are just joining. We'll get started in just a minute. Love to have you introduce yourself in the chat, where you're from and what field you're representing today. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. So glad to have you here with us today. My name is Stacy Perniski. I am a, a professor and social psychologist by training. I work for the Hope Center for College Community and Justice at Temple University in Philadelphia. And I'm here with my California colleagues to talk with you all about our Equitable Calculus for Life Sciences project and how we've been working on supporting student motivation and performance in STEM courses using utility value interventions. We're a large team and I'm very pleased to have three of my colleagues with me today and I'll ask them each to introduce themselves briefly. Alex, would you go first? Thank you, Stacy. Hi, my name is Alex Alexinko. I'm a faculty at California State University Northridge in the mathematics department. I work in computational mathematics, but also have interest in improving our educational programs and our classes. Uh, Bamda, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, my name is Bamda Sami. I'm um, from Los Angeles Mission College and uh, I'm the chair of the math department uh, at our college. Um, Par? Good morning, everyone. Par Mohammadian, life sciences faculty at Los Angeles Mission College. Thank you all. Very glad to have you. And if anyone um, who is joining us today has not yet introduced yourselves in the chat, we'd love to hear from you all what institution you're from uh, and what field you're in so that we can all have a sense of who's sharing the space with us today. Uh, I wanna acknowledge from the outset that um, our workshop is gonna focus on utility value interventions as the title of the workshop suggests, but we are also gonna touch on some other instructional strategies as well that we've been using as part of our broader equitable calculus project to equitably support student motivation and performance in STEM courses. So in our time today, uh, this is sort of the agenda we're working with. We're going to start by introducing our Equitable Calculus for Life Sciences project um, that will provide sort of the framework for our workshop. We'll talk a little bit about barriers that we observed for life sciences students in calculus courses and how we sought to address those with a redesigned course. We'll have some time for a discussion about barriers that you all have observed in your classes, both barriers that students face, as well as barriers that we face as educators in uh, trying to equitably support students in our classrooms. 
I'll also hear from a couple of my colleagues about their experiences implementing strategies to support students um, through our project in this redesigned course. Then we'll have a deeper dive into the theory behind utility value interventions and how to create utility value assignments, including some work time for you all to start creating assignments that you can use in your own courses. And then we'll close with a discussion. Uh, throughout our time together, we'll have a few different opportunities to get sort of real-time reactions and feedback from you all, as well as opportunities for you to reflect and discuss. So I just want to thank you in advance for your active participation in the workshop. Also want to acknowledge, uh, like I mentioned, we are part of a very large team and a very collaborative project. Um, so Equitable Calculus for Life Sciences includes a four-year university in California, as well as two community colleges. You can see them represented on the screen here, Cal State Northridge, Los Angeles Mission College, and Los Angeles Valley College. It's also a very interdisciplinary team. Uh, you can tell from those of us represented today, we include math faculty, life sciences faculty, social psychologists, uh, and also evaluators from uh, CSUN's Center for Assessment Research and Evaluation. So just want to acknowledge our amazing team. Um, a lot of work and um, a lot of person power has gone into what we're going to be sharing with you all today. So the impetus for this project was really thinking about a set of questions about why students were struggling in introductory STEM courses, and in our case specifically, in a calculus course for life sciences majors. And as we think about why we don't see more students succeeding in STEM courses, and especially why we don't see all students succeeding equally in STEM courses, uh, there are a few examples of things here on the screen Love to have you all interact as well if you want to throw in the chat other things that you think are really key in the context that you're working in. Um, certainly, there is no single factor that causes inequity in STEM. Um, you'll notice because we have multiple things on the screen, and I'm sure you all will share things that aren't on the screen as well, there's no single factor. Uh, that causes equity issues in STEM, and there's no single solution. We know that STEM courses and STEM careers have historically catered more to white men than to any other group. And for many of us, that means that the majority of our students are marginalized in our classrooms and in our fields. So our approach, as we were thinking about these questions and how we could redesign a calculus course um, for more equitable outcomes, was really to think about comprehensive strategies that we could use that would incorporate culturally responsive pedagogy to include uh, and improve the classroom environment as well as students' experiences so that students would feel supported and motivated throughout the course. Uh, the word motivation is something we're going to come back to several times during, the mo during um, this workshop, so I also just want to take one quick moment um, to talk about what I mean when I say motivation. What I'm talking here is about sort of the driving force or the energy behind goal-directed action. That's sort of a textbook definition of motivation, but we're really thinking about, you know, just what, what gives you energy behind your work, behind your engagement in the classroom, and what barriers get in the way. What we're not talking about here is personality. We're not talking about something fixed about an individual who is motivated or not motivated. We're talking about the way that a classroom environment can motivate students to keep them engaged, energized, excited to learn. So the Equitable Calculus Project, as I said, tried to take a really comprehensive approach to thinking about improving students' experiences and supporting their motivation. We include a lot of the strategies that are on the screen, uh, things like working to facilitate a culture change in our math departments, incorporating culturally responsive and context-based calculus curriculum, working on faculty professional development workshops, developing and implementing interventions to support students' positive beliefs about their abilities and about the usefulness and relevance of what they're learning, as well as their sense of belonging, and working to implement a mentorship program for students as well. The theme here 
is really taking every approach that we uh, found in the literature and in our own practices to support students by honoring the values and goals that they bring to the classroom and tailoring what we're doing in the classroom to things that they care about uh, and showing that we care about them. So we're going to talk about a few of the specific strategies on the next few slides. So first, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Alex, to share about our culturally relevant approach to contextualization. Hello. And um, so what we quickly discovered when we started on this project is that traditional delivery is not motivating our students. And Hello. we decided that we will capitalize on students' passions for their own majors. And the answer to that was to use contextualization. So we contextualize calculus course so that it is becoming relevant for students in biology, chemistry, and other life sciences. And one of the outcomes of this contextualization effort that I'm presenting here today are the daily worksheets that we develop for every topic in calculus and when you develop these worksheets, there are several things that you would like to put in there. So if possible, you'd like to use locally sourced data. So maybe from locality that we are in, we could get some numbers from some research that has been done previously. You would like to connect it to issues relevant to students. Um, and when students are working, uh, you definitely would like to set up an environment in such a way that students can collaborate and exchange ideas and learn from each other. Well, um, we can definitely see much be a lot better engagement in students when we work on these exercises. It has been to the level that many faculties, uh, you know, uh, it was difficult to convince some of the mass faculty to try them, but once they tried, they, they tend to stand with them, stay with this, doing these worksheets. So that's one of the products. And um, I'm passing the microphone to Bamdad Sami. Uh, who will talk about the other product that came out of this project. Uh, thank you, Alex. So the other thing we kind of looked at is what will motivate students to actually be engaged the same way they're engaged in their daily life. My son spends hours and hours on video games trying to win a virtual shoe uh, that he can wear on a game, but uh, you know he will not do anything any homework where he would actually gain something out of. So we tried to bring some of that into uh, our classrooms. So uh, in, in my class, uh, we have these cryptocurrencies, which are equivalent of a virtual item they could win. Uh, in, in this case, as they do their homework and as they uh, attend class, so they get points for certain activities, they're rewarded. Uh, but they're rewarded with these virtual currencies that they can then exchange for other perks in the class. Uh, for example, uh, if they have enough points, they can bring a, a cheat sheet to a test or they can get a hint on one problem on a test. They can actually uh, choose to exchange these for other things that they may value. Uh, and it depends on what they value uh, rather than what I think uh, they may value. Um, the other things we have kind of tried to do is we've created these escape room scenarios where they're actual games, but the um, solutions to uh, to get out of situations are actually calculus problems they need to solve. So the skills that they learn, they actually get to use within a game situation. There are a couple of these uh, links are up there. And again, the, uh, the PowerPoint will be shared so you can take a look. Uh, and we're in the process of make, maybe making a few more of these. And uh, then the other thing uh, uh, that Alex has uh, tried more uh, is actually the dividing students into teams, um, have them create uh, explanations and lessons of uh, for problems, record it and share it with other students. And then they um, kind of critique it and then um, uh, choose a winner. Uh, among those uh, things, uh, among the teams. So just a few ways we've tried to uh, bring some gamification into the classroom and try to make it a little more fun to actually learn the, uh, the subject. Okay, thank you. And back to me. So uh, back uh, to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
it, it wasn't all about games, of course. It was a big project with a lot of components. And from the get-go, we um, committed to a centering project around active learning, making our classroom uh, active learning. And the delivery was either fully flipped or hybrid, depending on the preference of instructor. And for to facilitate that, of course, a wealth of materials was prepared for Calculus for Life Sciences course. We have short videos, we have try to self little printouts examples. We have daily worksheets, the one that I shared a little earlier. We have collections of pre-class and post-class assignments, my open math, publisher content. We use, like some people use my open math, some people, some our campus uses publisher's content, unfortunately. And then we, of course, try to use uh, technology. All the apps that are available, we try to build it into the instruction to make it more visual, more intuitive. And um, uh, Hiring students and uh, training students to help the student groups, that was a big driver, keeping the health ratio one to eight. Uh, it turns out to be a game changer. We have great engagement in, in the classroom. We have very good attendance. And also that seems to percolate into the, in the student success rates. So additional element of this project was the utility value interventions that we will be primarily presenting today. And I'm passing the microphone to Stacy to talk about that. Thank you, Alex and Pamdad. Um, so utility value interventions, for those of you who aren't familiar, these are evidence-based activities that are designed to help students to see personal relevance and usefulness in course topics. The reason that we think this is really important is that, you know, the motivation literature really shows us that if students see what they're doing as worth it, if they see a personal value to the work that they're putting in in a course, they find the course more interesting and it gives them a sense of purpose for engaging. And we know from learning sciences that helping students to connect what they're learning to things that they know about and care about take them on this learning journey. And we know that if students can apply what they're learning to other aspects of their lives, that's an indicator that they really understand the content. We really see utility value interventions as going hand in hand with the other kinds of contextualization and other things we're doing in the course. But the utility value interventions really provide an opportunity to personalize the content, to give students a time and a space to take a step back and think about not just why my instructor tells me that calculus is related to future careers, but why is it related to me and to my career? It really helps to personalize the content. So what this looks like in our classrooms is that students are given three activities as course assignments. They're pretty short. They generally take students less than 15 minutes to complete. The students are given five quotes based on responses from former students about the usefulness of calculus. In the first assignment, we just ask them to read those quotes and think about which one's their favorite, which one is the most interesting or the most relevant to them. In the second assignment, we build on that by asking them to make their own connections to their own lives. And in the third assignment, we build again to have them think about additional connections as well as reflect on the way that their views of calculus might have changed over time. Um, these are done as homework, so they're graded, but just based on thoughtful completion. Um, and we have implemented this so far as an experiment. And so we also have a control group that does very similar activities, but instead of reading quotes about why the content is useful, they are reading sample calculus problems and reflecting on what makes a good homework problem. So what does this look like when we ask students to think about the value of calculus? Um, I'll put an example here. This is a, a response from one of our students in the Equitable Calculus for Life Sciences class. Uh, so this student told us, you know, I don't think anyone from the beginning willingly takes calculus with the intent of enjoying it, save for a few students who love math. But after actually experiencing the course, my perspective has changed. In every chapter, we're doing real world examples can see connections to red blood cells. Uh, calculus might be a difficulty spike, but along with it comes multiple opportunities to realize why math actually matters in this world. So you can really see from this quote, the way that these activities build on contextualization that's happening in the classroom and in the homework assignments and in the textbook and give students a chance to step back and think about the personal value of what they're learning. So the purpose of this project obviously was um, to 
address some equity gaps that we were seeing in calculus. Um, so what I wanna show you here in terms of results is uh, student success rates in the class um, represented here by grades of C or better in the course. The uh, full lines are the Calculus for Life Sciences contextualized course, and the dotted lines are a standard non-contextualized calculus course. We started implementing these strategies in spring of 2022. And what you can see is that since that time, we have seen higher success rates in the contextualized course, as well as um, generally lower equity gaps. And the three groups that we're focused on in this particular visualization are white students, Asian students, and Hispanic and Latina students. That's because those are the three most well-represented groups in our classrooms. Um, in particular, the Black student population on these campuses is really small, and so we don't have enough data to share outcomes for that group. One thing I will uh, acknowledge and draw attention to is that we did see a lower success rate among Hispanic and Latina students um, in this last spring. So we're keeping an eye on that this fall to see if that was an anomaly or if um, we're sort of missing the mark for those students. I also wanted to share some results of the utility value intervention, which, as I mentioned, we're implementing as an experiment. So we have a comparison against a control group in our classes. So what you see here on the left are impacts on some measures associated to students' motivation in the course. So what we see is that when students are given the opportunity to reflect on what they're learning and why it's useful to them, they have higher confidence in their ability in calculus, as well as greater perceptions that the course and content and what they're learning is helping them to feel better prepared for their future careers. And we've also seen really exciting impacts on student grades averaged over the three semesters that we've tested the intervention so far, we've seen an increase of almost half a grade point for students on average. I'm not showing results here as a function of race and ethnicity, because once we split into control and utility value groups, the ends start to get really small. But I can tell you descriptively that we do see positive effects for all three of the groups that I showed you on the previous slide, white students, Asian students, and Hispanic and Latina students. Before I move on, I also just want to acknowledge that we're really dedicated to making our materials open source. And so much of what we've talked about today, if you are interested in learning more, you can find our Canvas shell on Canvas Commons. It includes a lot of materials. Um, and you can, of course, always reach out to us as well if you would like to learn more. OK. One of the things we've really uh, learned and what I've shared about the value of these utility value assignments is that it gives folks an opportunity to just step back and reflect instead of always having knowledge thrown at them to take a minute and uh, to think about the way that what they're learning uh, is related to their own lives. So I'm gonna take a pause right now and allow you all to do the same. So I'm gonna throw a link in the chat uh, to a little survey form that we're going to use throughout the session. So we're just going to ask you a few questions for the moment. Just take maybe about three to five minutes uh, to allow you a moment to process what you've heard about so far. Think about the strategies that we've presented and think about the challenges and barriers that you're seeing for your students in your classroom and how what we've talked about so far applies to you. So hopefully you see that link in the chat and we'll give you a few minutes to process. You will see after you reach the end of the questions for this reflection opportunity, you'll see a stop sign. Um, so just stop there when you reach that point in the survey form.
as we come back, as folks reach that stop sign in the survey form, uh, I'd love to hear from a few volunteers uh, what you were reflecting on. If you want to share some barriers that you're seeing in your classrooms, barriers that you're experiencing in supporting students equitably, and what kinds of strategies you're using in your classrooms to help to address some of those issues. Feel free to use the chat if that is what you're most comfortable with. Also, please feel free to take yourself off um, mute and uh, share your thoughts. This semester I'm teaching a new course, um, well, new to me, it's applied math. And um, so it's a quantitative reasoning course. And um, I have a couple students who kind of feel like I'm not going to understand. So why come to class? Um, and so like the whole idea is that they're being exposed to these things in class, but then they just make it harder on themselves because then they try to learn on their own, which is, was never the intent. And so then they kind of, it's a self perpetuating cycle for some of these students. Um, I mean, I'm only talking about two, three students, but still that is, you know, a lot of students are taking that particular course because they um, wanted something that wasn't as algebra based and it's a very different course than what they're used to, which has its pros and cons for different student groups. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I think that really resonates <laughs> see others nodding. Absolutely resonates. Uh, we have those students too. And uh, yeah, maybe when eventually also I'm gonna summarize and piggyback on that comment. Okay, um, I wanna share something. My name is Laura Fatuzzo. I teach physics at Hartnell College in Salinas, which is a HSI institution. About 70% of our students are Hispanic. 11% we don't know, and then 9% white. Um, what we're finding with the students is that their lives are very complex, so they're taking on too much. Um, so many have to work up to 20, 30 hours, but in order to get financial aid, they have to take uh, 12 units. Um, so with STEM classes, we're seeing some of them, I don't know why, taking up to 21 units. Um, so actually yesterday I talked to the Dean about this and we have a student success center. Um, many are having mental health issues as well um, because of the stress. And in the Hispanic community, there's multi-generational households. So many of our students are caretakers of siblings, their parents and grandparents. Um, many are undocumented, so we have programs for them. Um, so it's really all of these life issues. They have the motivation, they have the skills, um, but they just are in a system that really is not helpful for their success. Um, also my classes, uh, my lectures are 81 students. Um, and so it's very difficult to do this group work. We try, um, and that's another thing we cannot control. Yeah, and especially even if those large classes, if you could make group work work, but the facility itself isn't conducive to students gathering in small spaces. Um, I wanna thank you for raising uh, some of these really systemic economic and other um, challenges that students are facing. I mentioned I work at the Hope Center at Temple University and our main mission is around addressing students' basic needs. So we're thinking about um, these issues all the time. There are a lot of things outside the classroom that universities need to deal with in addition to um, projects like this that are really focused on when students get to the classroom, what can we do to show them the care to make sure that the time they're investing, which is time away from their families, time away from their jobs, time away, right? They're, it's a real investment to attend class. And so how do we show them that we see them, that we want it to be useful and valuable to them, um, that we want to make sure that we are honoring everything that they're bringing to the classroom as well, uh, without ignoring that there are, there are all of these other issues going on simultaneously. 
um, that that we need we need to help students with as well. Yeah, Robin, go ahead. Okay, yeah, real quick. Um, so I teach at Long Beach City College. We're also a Hispanic serving uh, institution, and so I definitely can relate to some of the challenges with family obligations, work obligations that our student population faces. Um, one small way that I've been trying to um, sort of address this is I found that actually using and sort of collecting input from previous students who have gone through the struggles and found a way through my five unit microbiology class, collecting little narratives from them and what they found work and trying to share that out because I don't want to come across and pretend that I totally understand their situation and their barriers, but collecting those narratives from previous students. And I find that, oh, okay, you know, um, this student really struggled. They had to work at Costco 50 hours a week, but they found a way to study because he would put earbuds in. And as he was collecting the carts, he would listen to my lectures and he would squeeze in the, the study time and students were looking at us and be like, oh, oh, wow, that's interesting. Okay. You know, so just trying to share little snippets of um, how other students made it work, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. That really resonates with what we're going to talk about um, in in the latter half of our time together when we talk about how to build out utility value interventions. I mentioned we give quotes from former students, and it's exactly the kinds of narratives that you're that you're talking about. Um, you know, being being honest and open about sharing about the difficulties with the content and with balancing. Uh, how to make how to make space for school among the rest of the things that are going on in students' lives is really powerful. Uh, I don't want to stop this conversation, but I do want to keep us moving. So I, I'm going to apologize to those of you. I do see there are a couple other raised hands. I would love for you to add your thoughts to the chat as we continue talking um, so that we can stay on schedule for our time together, but also benefit from all the expertise that I know you all are able to share. Uh, what I'd like to do now is pass it back to a couple of my colleagues. Um, what we've shared so far was sort of a research presentation about things that we've done, but I also wanted to bring in sort of the, the humanistic instructor perspective on what we've done in the classroom. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to my two colleagues to talk a little bit about what it has been like to try to implement some of these strategies to address barriers in their classrooms. So... Um... I would like to go first, and uh, my name is Alex Alcinko again. I'm from Mass Department of Cal State Northridge, if you recently joined. And yes, it's first of all, thank you so much for coming and, and sharing your pers perspectives. It, it is very, you know, it is a clear understanding that there is no one solution that fixes everything, and, and that's not a happy understanding. <laughs> I, I wish that would be, but... Um, so, so we will, but we would like to share what we've learned and what sort of worked for uh, to some extent. And I would like to follow, like piggyback on the comments that we received. So for, for example, flipping the classroom, right? So one of the things that we did, we flipped the classroom. It was very, very difficult to give up for me to, for me to give up lecturing. But once, once I kind of did it and, and got over it, um, I figured out a couple of things. Well, first, uh, it actually was working okay. Second, it was a lot of fun. Third, I was able, for the first time in my entire career, meet my students, every single one of them in the classroom. It will be a little bit harder for Laura to do because she you, she still has hundreds of them. But for me, it was about 40. So yeah, that's what was fi finally possible. And one of the things that I've learned is that... Um, Having this uh, the flipped classroom actually worked for some of the students who have other obligations. Uh, some of my students enjoyed the additional flexibility and unfortunately stopped showing up for classroom. And I ask them, okay, guys, why are you not coming? And they say, I picked up work. And But these students stay engaged. We stayed in communication and they were able to complete the course successfully. Some of them get A's, many got B's. So, so it was actually a success story. So I don't know if that's the answer, but I also liked um, Robin's example, how she collects the testimonials. I think role models is, is a big deal. And that in the combination with flexibility 
might provide one little bit of um, solution, like one, one component of the complex solution that we're looking at. Um, now, also contextualized worksheets in the group work, student group works. So when I looked at these worksheets as a mathematician, I was extremely dubious. The examples are looks so excruciating, numbers looks excruciating. And we did make those simple. They are very confusing biological uh, driven formulations, chemistry driven formulations. But when I saw how students are excited about it you and the energy that comes out of it, it was clear that it was a good move. So appealing to student passions, right? And reminding them, like, why are they here? What are they learning? How is this going to move them forward? Turns out to be another little bit of uh, helping those students who come, like Chantal was saying, there's students who come and, 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 and say, why am I showing up? Because I will not understand anything. So we have them. We have good percentage of these students and uh, the group work where the student assistants are able to answer questions on time in the group setting, building social connections. The, you know, here's this, one of the revelations that students give you is that, well, I thought I'm the only one who doesn't understand it, but now there's three of us and we kind of feel better to stick around and sit in class. So it seems like a flipped instruction does work a little bit in, into that favor. Um, and I believe there's plenty of research that suggests that that's a real thing. Now, but the other component that we're talking about is utility value interventions. These are very, very simple to implement in your classroom. You just give it the assignments outside of the class time. You don't have to use the class time. Students write those little responses. And when you read those responses, it is breathtaking. Because if you ask me before this project started, what do my students care about? I will probably answer, is this going to be an exam? But after reading, reading all of these responses, I realized that there is a deep thinkers on the other side of the aisle, and they care a lot about their learning and about their lives and, and careers in future. And for me as an instructor, that was eye-opening, and I definitely appreciated that the power of the UV intervention, and they also affect grades positively. Okay, so I think this is my little testimonial. I pass it on to Bamda. Yeah, I would say I probably shared this similar um, uh, problems in the class with flipped classroom. Um, so one thing that uh, the first time I had done it, uh, I noticed that students uh, tend to not attend class if they think that they, all the content is available for them prior, if the lectures are recorded. So it takes a little bit of selling and making sure they're convinced that what they're going to do in class will benefit them. Um, so, you know, a, a few strategies, again, I, that I have tried to use. Um, every class starts with a quiz that's taken directly from a pre-classroom quiz they have to complete at home. It's the same problem with slightly different numbers. But again, we'll bring a little bit of gamification to it. There is a virtual wheel we spin, and on that wheel, uh, there are prizes possibly where if they were there and completed the test, whether they got it right or wrong, they would they could get 20 points or five points towards the test. Um, there, uh, or it just says this quiz is worth 10 points today. Uh, so there are other outcomes on there tomorrow. The teacher will bring you donuts. So there's uh, there, but they have to be there to actually. Uh, part uh, gets the reward, or uh, so there. Um, I noticed because of that, we do get a lot more students who come there and come early because the quiz is the first five ten minutes. So there are some of these strategies we've kind of tried to bring in. Uh, but one thing again, oh, I noticed um, a couple of things. So first of all, I saw something in the chat about the uh, prior knowledge. So one way we've tried to um, bridge that gap, at least in my class, is leverage the existing technology. So uh, as they're working a problem and they don't know how to do the algebra, they're allowed to use and uh, go and use Symbol Lab or some other uh, um, software that will close that algebra gap, right? So they can focus on the calculus and the theory of we've, what we're trying uh, to get them to understand. Right. We want to know, we want them to know how calculus 
is applied in biology and how the modeling part of that works. So if they cannot factor a trinomial, we don't want that to all of a sudden stop them and not let them to go forward, right? So uh, again, so some of that we try to uh, remedy with uh, the technology that's there. Um, I guess um, I'll send it back to you, Stacy. Thank you so much, Alex and Bamdad. All right, I want to take um, a moment for another reflection period. Uh, so we're going to go back to that same survey form. Uh, now that you have heard from each other and heard again from my colleagues about their experiences as instructors implementing some of these strategies, uh, I'd like you to take a couple of minutes to reflect on um, whether you think these strategies these strategies would be valuable for you or for your students. Uh, encourage you to be honest in your reflection here. You won't hurt our feelings if the answer is no, um, but we do just wanna give you again, some space to pause, to reflect and to think about how this might apply to you and your classrooms. Um, so we'll do about five minutes of um, quiet reflection time. You'll see again on um, that survey that you'll come to a stop sign when you're done with um, the activities for this reflection period. And I'll throw the link in the chat again uh, for anyone who might have closed the window or uh, who joined us later. I'm going to put this link in one more time. Uh, if this is your first time visiting the survey form uh, because you joined us a little later, feel free to go past the first stop sign in that survey form and go through the activities to the second stop sign.
All right, I'm going to start to call us back in. Feel free to keep typing in that survey form if you want some additional time to reflect um, for yourselves. Uh, but I, I want to ask a couple reflection questions for us to just think about. Do you think that hearing directly from other instructors about why those strategies were valuable for them made you any more or less likely to use those strategies than just hearing about them in our initial presentation. Uh, and if if you're open to it, if you think that hurting, hearing directly from Alex and Bomdad about their experiences uh, made you more likely to try to use some of these strategies or increase their use if you're using them already, if you could give me a thumbs up emoji or come off camera and give a thumbs up, I'd love to, to hear from you all if you found that um, to be useful or impactful. Thank you. I'm also curious. Um, what about the time to do a self-reflection and um, little writing or journaling activity? Did that make you any more likely, do you think, um, to actually think about trying or increasing some of these strategies in this classroom than if you had just listened to the same discussion and not taken time to reflect? Uh, same thing, if you found that opportunity to reflect and pause and write, useful? Could you give me a thumbs up so I know what you're thinking? All right. Thank you. I, I appreciate um, that feedback and that opportunity to just hear from you all. Um, what we have just done together is essentially the elements of the utility value intervention that we've been talking about, right? You heard what were essentially quotes from um, our two instructors here, Alex and Bomdad, about the usefulness of some strategies that they were trying to implement. And then we took some time to reflect as individuals on um, how that might be valuable for us in our own classrooms. And that's exactly what the utility value intervention is designed to provide for students, an opportunity to hear from other students about why what they're learning might be valuable or useful, and some time to reflect and really think for themselves personally uh, what might be the value of what they're learning. I want to acknowledge there are a lot of different strategies for helping students on this journey of thinking about the relevance and usefulness of what they're learning. We can certainly tell students why we think what we're teaching is valuable or useful or important. And that's that's great. That's um, all, again, wrapped up in the contextualization that we do and in sharing our own passion for the topics that we teach. We can also give opportunities for students to write about why what they're learning is useful. And we can share quotes from other students about why what they're learning is useful. Um, these are all good strategies. You might have a sense from our activities so far in the session about which ones of those strategies work best for you um, as a learner slash audience member. Um, but you can also imagine that combining those activities uh, as we tried to do in our calculus course might be particularly uh, useful for reaching um, a number of different students where they are um, and helping them to think about the relevance of what they're learning in multiple different ways. I do wanna acknowledge uh, the utility value intervention activities that I'm talking about are based on uh, decades of research and theory, as well as um, field research. So the theory that utility value interventions are based on is Eccles and colleagues expectancy value theory. Um, this is a theory of student motivation and choice in academic settings. And it's really based on these two big questions that we ask ourselves motivationally. 
One is, can I do this thing? So in our context, calculus, can I succeed in learning calculus? And is it worth doing? Does it have value for me? Because it's interesting, because it will help me in my future career, because um, my identity as a math person or as a STEM major or as a future doctor or um, what have you, I'll, I'll require me um, or encourage me to focus on what I'm learning. Students are asking themselves these questions implicitly or explicitly as they're deciding how much effort to put into a course, whether to take the next course in the sequence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as I said, there's a big um, literature out there that tests these kinds of utility value activities in different forms. It's been tested in high school and in college uh, in a number of different STEM uh, subjects. I'm not going to go through this whole table, but wanted to make sure it was there in the slides for anyone who might find it useful. And what we see in the literature is impacts on students' motivation, on students' performance in um, their courses, and also on persistence in the STEM pipeline. So in our Equitable Calculus for Life Sciences course and our project, uh, we use this quote approach where we provide students with quotes and then opportunities to reflect on those quotes and write about um, their own experiences. What I'm showing you here is an example from one of the utility value assignments in our course. Uh, this is sort of a a hybrid quote. Some of these words are things that I wrote. Much of it is copied and pasted from things that students have written in assignments that were turned in uh, to our instructors over the last few semesters. I want to highlight a couple um, things in this particular quote that are part of the secret sauce of what uh, we try to do with our utility value interventions. One is that many students have negative feelings about our courses. This is especially true when we're teaching you know, introductory survey courses for students that might not be majoring in the topic that we're teaching. So it's really important to acknowledge some negative feelings that are totally normal, um, but also that are changeable, right? That, that help students to see they could be open to thinking differently about a topic that they might not be in love with when they first sign up for the course. We try to include specific connections to uh, things that are of relatively common interest among our students. You know, one of the things that we did starting out was a survey of our students about um, how they thought that what they were learning was useful, what kinds of connections they saw, which topics um, they saw as the most related to their lives, so that we really got a sense of what are some of these common interests and common connections that might be good to include in our quotes. And we also try to really think about students' values that they're bringing into the classroom. You know, a lot of our students in, in life sciences are really excited to go into um, health-related fields or helping professions or just really want to use whatever work they're doing to give back to their families or their communities. So we think it's important um, to integrate some of those values into the quotes that we're sharing with students as well. Here's another example. Uh, and again, I'm going to highlight a few things that we think um, are really important to create a set of quotes that represent a range of uh, student perspectives and that provide at least one um, quote in each of our assignments, which um, each contain five quotes. I want to make sure there's one that's going to resonate, um, hopefully, with each student. So we try to include a mix of authentic ex um, opinions. Some are positive, some are negative, but they all skew toward uh, positive um, experiences in the course or opinions of calculus by the end of students' interaction with it. We include a mix of concrete and abstract um, connections that are general or specific. Um, so sometimes it's a, a particular concept from the class that's related to a particular career. Sometimes it's just acknowledging the value of math or of calculus generally in helping students to think abstract connection, but what resonates with some students who have a hard time finding those specific connections. We also want to make sure that we're representing various student identities. Um, so we ascribe all of our quotes to specific individuals. We represent a mix of genders and um, racial and ethnic backgrounds and uh, majors and ages. Uh, and we try to avoid stereotypes. So like this example, um, we have 
someone in a male stereotyped major, but that person is in fact uh, female identifying. So again, just representing uh, diversity and in, in ways of thinking about calculus and identities, etc. I'll show you one um, final example that again highlights some of the things we try to include in the mix of all our assignments. Um, recognizing that struggling in courses is absolutely normal, um, but providing students with examples of strategies about how to um, how to improve. We heard this um, from one of our audience members today that those narratives about overcoming struggle and providing examples of strategies can be really valuable for students. And um, we try to work in, you know, positive framings of challenge, thinking about um, struggles, about mistakes as opportunities to learn and grow and something that isn't all negative. It's also, you know, valuable for the learning experience. I also want to specifically call out that there are a lot of equity um, considerations when you're writing these quotes. We need to really think about when we make examples that are relevant to the average student who is left out. Um, there's this really classic example of word problems that are on standardized tests, um, story problems about whether it's more makes more financial sense to buy a weekly bus pass versus a daily bus pass when this was um, enacted in tests, they found that students answered the question really differently depending on whether their parents had white collar jobs that were nine to five, five days a week, or had multiple jobs that required them to go to multiple locations in a single day to work seven days a week, et cetera. It actually changes the answer to the math problem depending on how you think about how often and how far folks need to go um, to work. So we really wanna be careful um, to be thinking about the range of student backgrounds, um, the range of experience. We wanna think about making sure that our content is relevant to students with vastly different experiences, different goals, uh, and really avoid including stereotypes in our examples as well, thinking about how we can um, implement counter stereotyping and positive role models into the quotes that we're creating. Uh, everything that I've shown you so far has been math examples. There are other examples. I won't take time to read through um, these, but we're going to have time in just a couple minutes for you all to think about what kinds of quotes you might write for an assignment in your own course. Um, and that um, survey form we're going to do the work in also has examples um, from other courses. These are some science ones um, that I threw up here just as examples, but want to acknowledge this can be done in a lot of different fields, not just math, and I will provide examples from more than just calculus um, for you all to work with and think about. Okay, so at this point, I would love for us to just um, try this to provide an open space for you again to think about how this might apply in your classrooms. So that survey form that we've been using has, um, after that stop sign, um, a space for you to work out some examples of your own. It has a link to a complete assignment um, from our Calculus for Life Sciences course. If you'd like to look at that to see how do we frame this assignment for students? What do the instructions look like? What does the full set of five quotes look like? Um, how do we frame the activity to help students um, to reflect on the quotes, et cetera? That full, um, example assignment is linked right in that form. And there's also a list of quotes from a variety of um, different courses for you to take a look at. Um, what we're going to do now is open up some breakout rooms. So we're going to put you in a small group setting. You decide what is um, best work time for you. You might have a conversation with others who are in your group. You might decide to just work individually. Um, totally up to you how you want to use the space. Um, but we thought it might be nice to be sort of in a small group setting while we work on this activity. Um, we're going to give folks about 10 minutes um, in the breakout rooms. 
Uh, I will stay in this main room. If anyone has any questions, um, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes to sort of reflect on how that process went, answer any questions that you all might have about implementing utility value interventions, et cetera. Um, but before I ask you all to join breakout rooms, just a quick space. Anyone have any questions before we go into this activity? Bomb Dad, would you mind opening breakout rooms for us? While we're waiting for that, I'll just acknowledge um, my inspiration for quotes come from lots of different places. Um, surveys of students, after you get started, you'll have lots of examples that students will write you from their assignments that you can work from. I also um, pull assignments from articles that I read online about how, <laughs> how scientists use math. Um, as an example, I read um, contextualized textbooks, take a look at what kinds of word problems they're using, what kinds of connections. I don't always have the expertise to know how calculus, for example, connects to these six different life sciences topics. Um, so I um, use textbooks and other, other sources. I talk um, to professionals about how they use math, um, how they use knowledge from different fields lean on um, lean on colleagues to help as well. Um, so inspiration can come from lots of places, um, but I just wanna have a space right now to sort of test it out um, for yourself based on what, um, what initial connections come to mind. Um, when we implement this assignment, we do it as homework. So students work on it on their own time outside of class. All right, are, are the breakout rooms open for us, Bamdan? Yeah, people are joining. They should. Band. Yes. And I mentioned in the chat, if anybody needs help uh, joining the rooms, please, please let us know in the chat which room you want to get into and we'll help you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Stacy, should some of us like join the rooms too or we we, we just sit here? <laughs> That is totally up to you. I am gonna stay in the main room just in case anyone has any technical um, difficulties. Um, oh. Thanks for sharing that bomb dad. Okay. Absolutely no problem, <laughs> that was an issue. And I apologize if there was confusion. Um, but in general, we have a couple minutes now um, for open discussion. If anyone would like to ask questions about utility value um, activities, about writing quotes, uh, thoughts about whether or how you think this might work in your own courses, or if you're trying um, to think about maybe giving students some of these activities to think about the usefulness of what they're learning. Um, any questions? Stacey, I, I just, we talked a lot in our group about contextualization and awesome. we, some of us have had experiences with our schools offering like maybe a calculus for business majors or like calculus for a certain other course uh, field. Um, and in my particular college, uh, we do have a calculus for um, business, but we also are very small. So we have one section of calculus and calculus two doesn't even always run because we have so few students. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we were talking a lot about contextualization. Um, and I think part of my question at the beginning is, um, is the utility value interventions, those things where like you're giving the time to reflect on how it applies to you, which is different than like contextualization or all these other things that you've mentioned. So I'm, I'm kind of wanting to know the definition or the, what these activities you keep referencing. Can you just like provide like a list to be a little bit more clear as to what specific interventions that we can like apply? Yeah. This is more theoretical right now. 
Absolutely. Um, so when I talk about utility value interventions, I'm specifically talking about these activities, often their homework assignments, that give students space to think about how what they're learning relates to them personally. It's very closely associated, and I see them working hand in hand and working really well together with contextualization, which is about the way that we present material to students, talking about um, not just how to execute this particular formula, but how to execute this particular formula in the context of this way that it's used in the real world. Um, you can think about different ways that you use story problems in homework as being another contextualization tool, right? Not just having students work out um, math problems. Again, I'm using you know math as an example, um, but giving them story problems that show the way that that math is actually used. So contextualization is how you present um, the, the topics, it's which textbooks you choose, it, it's what your homework looks like, and utility value interventions are these um, specific strategies to give students space to connect the material back to themselves personally. Did that help? Yeah, that's what I thought. I just wanted some clarity that... No, thank you. I, that's... Very valuable, and I, I'm very confident there were there were others who benefited from your question. So thank you for asking. Other questions, thoughts? Okay, I had in, I also joined the room, and one of the discussions is that. If you Google utility value interventions, nothing will come up. And some people may well find that, that is it really, you know, a thing? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. If you Google scholar utility value interventions, you might find some academic articles. Um, I actually wondered when I put this together about whether to use that terminology um, because utility value interventions is a very academic way to refer to what are really just guided activities that help students connect with their learning to their own lives. Um, you could call it any number of, of different things. There is a literature base for it in educational and social psychology, as well as in some, um, you see, you know, some um, field specific education journals have articles about it. Um, you're welcome to look at the literature if, if that is exciting to you. Um, but really at the end of the day, all we're talking about is activities that encourage students to think about the personal value of what they're learning. Other thoughts, questions? Well, I think contextualizing really allows students to maybe make that connection because that context might be what makes them feel connected to it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And that's why I see these strategies going hand in hand. When I was invited to join this project and they shared with me that this was gonna be a really highly contextualized course, I wondered whether doing a utility value intervention would have any impact whatsoever because we're already doing all of this contextualization. So there should be lots of opportunities for students to see why calculus is useful and how it's related to their future careers when it's a course for life sciences majors and all of the content, we refer back to life sciences and how it's useful. I expected to see no impact whatsoever of giving them this additional opportunities to reflect on personal value. What we saw was big impacts on students' motivation and an average of half a grade point increase in their performance across three semesters. I didn't think that giving them this additional space was gonna have that big of an impact in a course that's already contextualized, but actually giving students the space and showing them that you care about them making those connections to themselves personally, still, even in a contextualized course, had a really big impact. Um, so that was definitely something that I learned from this project, um, that still, even though we're telling them all the time how this is connected, giving them that personal reflection time can be really valuable for students. Let, let me pitch in. So how did it all start, right? So I we asked Stacy, you know, we have all of the students in our classrooms. 
And we look at these students and we know if they just tried a little bit higher, harder, if they just push a little bit, they would be good in class. But students disengage. And we ask, you know, what's happening in their head, in their minds, when they make that decision? And Stacy broke it down for us. It's a motivational question. Is this interesting? Is this useful? Is this something that I think I can be doing? Right. And if the answers are no, student disappears. So the next question we ask Stacy, how can we postpone that decision like a couple of weeks? Right. <laughs> so that we keep students in the classroom for a little bit longer. And the answer came uh, that these reflections. These reflections allow students a reminder, remind them why they are here. Why is this uh, not remind them, but help them figure out why they are here. And um and that usually brings a positive outcome. So contextualization was one of the elements. You see, like, we are in a position where, you know, like, think about pandemic, right? In the beginning, every possible drug was thrown at it. And we're starting by, <laughs> and eventually we narrowed down to a vaccine, right? But we started this conversation with a clear understanding there is multitude of issues affecting our success of our students and classes. So in this project, we decided to throw everything we've got. And one of the things was contextualization, but another thing was the UV. And the, and the, and the active learning was another thing. And then there were some other, other, other things that we didn't talk about. Thank you, oh. Alex. Uh, I am looking at the time and seeing that we just have a couple minutes left in our session. So I want to call attention to a few things. Um, you probably noticed if you were referring back to that survey form, there was one more stop sign. Um, what comes at the end of this form, which I am hopeful that you all will agree to take a look at now or even um, later today when you have a spare moment, um, there's some opportunities for you to give feedback to us about the workshop and how it went, um, as well as spaces for you to put in your email address if you would like a copy of your own responses. If you um, worked on some sample quotes and want to be able to um, save those, you can put in your email address and we'll send you a copy of your survey form. Uh, if you want to hear from us, if you want additional resources, if you're interested in um, collaborating or receiving support from us in implementing any of those strategies, there's a space for you to indicate that as well. Um, also a space for you to volunteer up any um, quote drafts that you worked on to create a library that we can share out with folks who are here. Um, these slides will be shared, the video will be shared, you are absolutely welcome um, to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, I wanna acknowledge not just all of the collaborators on this project, but also um, the collaborators that I've worked on on utility value work generally, um, in particular, Judith Harakevich is the pioneer in this, in this field and I've worked with her and many of her students and collaborators over time. And here is our contact information. Uh, if you should like to reach out to us, I want to thank you so much um, for your engagement uh, with us today, for your time, um, for how thoughtful you are in the way that you are supporting students and in your willingness to consider uh, lots of strategies as you're looking to support your students. Um, so again, I hope you will go back to that survey form and give us um, that feedback and take opportunity um, to seek any resources that we could provide for you. Uh, and I want to, with our last minute, just turn it back over to Kaylin for um, some advice for us on how we can get to our next set of sessions. And thank you again so much uh, for being here. Hello, everyone. Um, so I just uh, wanted to just take a moment to direct you to the chat. Uh, where you will see we're going to have a quick break to stretch and take care of ourselves in this space. Um, and the next session is going to begin at 1045. Uh, we have two options. You can click on the um, on the schedules to look at everything, or you can just click on, uh, oh, shoot. You're going to need to click on the schedule because it's not allowing me to click on the, um, it didn't allow me to paste the links for the join Zoom meeting. So just make sure to click on that first link uh, for Google Sites, and you have those two options to choose from. And uh, thank you, team. Oh, my goodness. What a beautiful 
What a beautiful session. Thank you so, so much. Hey, everybody. Welcome. We're so glad you're joining us. We're waiting maybe a couple more minutes for people to get connected. All right. Um, so my name's Trisha Foley. Um, we're going to get started in a couple seconds here, but while we're waiting, we'd love if you could introduce yourself. And we actually have a couple questions for you. Um, so we'd love if you can introduce yourself in the chat and say where you're from and what you teach. And then um, the extra assignment is our whole talk is about mentoring. So we're wondering what's your motivation for mentoring students? Because as um, faculty members and as, as people who work in an education system, we all work towards mentoring. Um, so what is your, your motivation for mentoring your students? And could you describe a successful mentoring moment or a challenge that you faced just briefly? <laughs> so um, we have a lot to talk about, but we just wanna get a little sense of um, who we are and what our motivations are. You want it in the chat or do you want us to call? Sorry, yeah, so we, um, we are, so we do want you to talk about it. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna introduce ourselves and say what our motivation is, but, um, we would love if you would also chime in too. So I'll I'll say it again for the few people who have um, joined. We're going to introduce ourselves. While we're introducing ourselves, we'd love if you could think about what your motivation is for mentoring students, and if you can introduce yourself either by chat or um, verbally, what your motivation is, where you're from, and um, what your role is on your campus. So I'm Trisha Foley. I teach chemistry and engineering here at College of the Canyons. So College of the Canyons is located in Northern LA County. Um, so we're a suburb for LA. I am only informally mentoring students right now. So a lot of my students reach out to me and want for informal mentorship um, sorts of relationships, but I don't have any formal mentees right now, but I am the PI on our STEM grant. So the STEM grant, we're gonna talk more about it later, but it really focuses on creating these mentorship structures for students. So we're really working hard to create a mentorship structure at our community college. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Jeannie. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jeannie Chari, also from College of the Canyons. And um, I am in the biological and environmental sciences department here. Um, I teach organismal biology and a lot of environmental science stuff. I also uh, coordinate our campus biodiversity initiative. So I am an active mentor in a couple of different capacities. I actively mentor students on um, unpaid internships on biodiversity projects on our campus and also community outreach. And I also actively mentor students in paid internships through an NSF biodiversity grant that we have um, to monitor native bee populations and in, increase their habitat. So I mentor students um, because it brings me a, a great feeling of joy. And Teresa? Hi, um, so I teach physical science and astronomy, but I'm also the advisor of the Astronomy and Physics Club. And um, within that club, we have a team of students that compete with universities around the world to have their student designed and constructed experiments go to space and participate with NASA. Uh, so I have been formally mentoring students for eight years on these NASA projects now. And, uh, you know, I volunteer hundreds of hours each year and it doesn't even matter how much time I put into this because the growth that I see in these students as people, not just in their STEM skills, but as people is amazing. And I think one of my greatest mentor moments um, happened this past year, I had a former student who got hired at Millennium Space as the electrical systems engineer hire a more recent former student to be his intern. 
So I had a student hire a student. I mean, how amazing is that? So, you know, that's why I do what, that's why I volunteer the time. That's why I do what I do. Does anybody else have any, um, I, I know a few people have shared in the chat, but does anyone want to share verbally why, why they mentor or what their motivation is, or just some like gems that it can motivate us all? Um, I can, my name is Anita Data. I am from uh, San Jose City College, fighting for environmental science and human biology. And um, get a variety of students, you know, some of the they just have to have a science class with lab and some are majors and some are going to go into allied health and, and all kinds of students. And I don't have any formal mentoring role, but I encourage students a lot to come talk to me and sometimes they'll take it off. Well. And uh, so I had this student who told me about how many challenges he had and all that. And then one of the things they found was that he had real trouble taking notes in class. And so then I said, you know, I can show you if you give me the time. So he would come to my office hours and, and I would like kind of sort of do kind of like a little sample lecture and say, now what would you write down? Okay, in addition to the stuff I'm writing on the board. And so he did all that. And then um, his score started to improve. That was very, very gratifying. And I want to learn formally more like structured mentorship because I'm interested in kind of, you know, getting the best out of my students uh, and doing the best I can do. Um, and you guys asked for a funny or, or a special moment. So this guy who I was helping with people notes, one day he came and he took out these slides that I didn't, I'd never seen. I'm like, what is this? So I feel in my environmental science class. He goes, this is history. This is my history class. We'll make notes for my history class today. I said, no, I don't know anything. <laughs> so, I mean, but I kind of take that as something probably worked because he wanted to help me with the other part. But... Yes, exactly. And I like that you said you're not a formal mentor, but um, you're an informal mentor. I feel like we are all informal mentors at, at our institutions. Um, and and we love like the, the energy it gives us. Is it Joanne or Joan? Um, actually, it's both. Um, my name is Joan or Joanne King. I work at Santa Monica College in the Career Center as one of their career advisors. And uh, uh, in particular, I work with our STEM students. Um, and I help our STEM students find experience from different things on campus to off campus. And I think um, my best moments are just hearing from students get these opportunities during the summer, throughout the year, and then coming back um, and hearing about their experiences. And so um, I really like that. I actually had a student, and I'm really proud about this student because I met the student last year during their first year um, and said, I, I wanna work for NASA. And I was just like, these are the steps. Come back this summer, he pops into my office and says, I got a NASA internship. I did all the things that you wanted me to do. And now I'm actually at one of the NASA facilities doing some work with them um, this school year. So I'm excited um, for that student as well as all my other students who have accomplished their goals of gaining some experience. Yes, exactly. And I, I'm so glad you were there to help them guide because that's, that's part of what students need from us, right? They need us to help them figure it out. Um, okay, so great. We're gonna, we do have a, a a lot to talk about today. So I'm just gonna start by going over our learning outcomes. We're hoping that um, today we can convince you that formal mentorship programs are really important, specifically for um, promoting equity among our STEM students, so, which is what this conference is all about. Um, we wanna list behaviors that are needed for positive mentoring experiences um, because mentoring is a skill, right? We don't, we're not born with it. It's important that we all continue to develop our skills in mentoring. So we just wanna point out some of the important parts of mentoring. And then, and then finally develop or describe why group mentorship, a group mentorship structure is, um, has a lot of benefits at the community college level because we ha we have some very specific challenges in our educational settings that we College of the Canyons is a um, community college and so we have some challenges that we don't that aren't as um, present in the four year school in our four year counterparts so we want to talk about why group mentoring is important for our students 
Um, so I'm just going to get started with why effective mentoring relationships are important for STEM students. So as you think back to your STEM education, you probably can identify at least one or two or three mentors that you had along the way, right? And what were those mentors doing for you? They were doing two different major roles um, with career support and psychosocial support. So career support is what we think of usually with when we think of these mentor mentee relationships. So we as mentors can help our students think critically about their goals. Um, we can help facilitate exploration of their interests, abilities, beliefs, and ideas, because sometimes they know what they're interested in, but they don't know what job that really fits into. So we can help them explore those different avenues. Um, we can review progress towards their goals and give them feedback over if they're making progress or if they should change directions a little bit. Um, we can educate them as educators, that's our job, evaluate and challenge them both academically and professionally, right? So push them, meet them where they are and push them exactly um, where they can go next. Um, and then another really important part of mentoring is being able to, to publicly acknowledge them, right? It's a lot, it means a lot for somebody who is in a more advanced position for our students to, than our students for them to hear us say, I acknowledge that this student is a good student and this student has what it takes to be a STEM professional. So that's part of what mentoring is. Um, all of those things or most of those things can be done more in an advisory role though too. Um, so what's the difference between a mentorship role and a, a, just an academic advisor? It's really the psychosocial support side. So what we mean by that is we really, as mentors encourage our mentees, we give them, um, confidence that they can do what they've set out to do and we help them solve problems that they run into along the way. Um, mentors also guide their mentees behaviors, values, and attitudes. They help them see um, what, what the landscape is in their chosen field and help them guide, help guide them into the different behaviors that are needed to succeed in that environment. Um, and then Above all, we, we allow our mentees to see themselves as future practitioners. We give them the confidence, we give them um, the ability to really, to really have confidence in themselves. So that's a lot of what we are doing as mentors and why it's important because to be successful, you need support both on the career side and on the um, psychosocial side. Those are, those are important for all types of mentorships, all of those things we talked about. So from very early times um, to even now I have faculty or I have mentors above me and those, those um, things that I just talked about are important for me to receive as a mentee too. Um, one of the things we wanna convince you of today is that it's really important for our students, even at the community colleges, to start to work into that mentorship framework. We don't want our students to wait until they get to the four-year schools to start to form those relationships with professors, um, because what happens is they, they already are missing some skills of forming, of being part of the STEM um, community. So it's really important for our students at community colleges to have mentorships too. Um, and we know this because the literature shows that student faculty interactions, interactions with us can help develop their um, academic self-concept. It can develop their motivation and it can lead to higher student achievement levels, which is 100% what we want, right? We want our students to, to be motivated. We want our students to achieve. Um, student engagement and inclusion uh, studies have shown are really important for our students to remain engaged and in our STEM community. So retention in STEM. When we talk about equity, we wanna make sure that we're serving all of our students. We wanna make sure that all of our students feel included in our communities. And one way we can do that is by creating those one-on-one -on -one or those um, personal relationships with our students. So they feel like they are part of our our community of STEM practitioners. Um, and then finally, personalized educational opportunities can build cultural capital among students. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna spend some time while we're gonna talk more about cultural capital. The grant that we're working on, the STEM grant that we're working on is, is focused on building different types of capital within our students. Um, one of those is cultural capital. So cultural capital is a little bit of a confusing term. So I just wanted to define it from the beginning. Um, cultural capital is the attitudes, knowledge, and behaviors that are recognized as correct by gatekeepers. 
because we're talking about how helping students succeed in STEM fields, we're really talking about the culture that surrounds STEM. So we're not talking about the different individual cultures that surround our um, social networks and our social backgrounds. We're talking about what, what is considered to be correct within the field of STEM. So one of those things, some examples of that, one of those things is credentials, right? Having a degree is needed to succeed in STEM fields, but that's not the only thing that's needed, right? Our students also need to be able to talk about um, technical things. They need to be able to talk easily with us or um, relate to faculty and to other STEM practitioners easily. Um, their dress and their the manner, the way they hold themselves, the way they engage with other people matters in STEM fields. And then there's also this hidden curriculum. What, what do you do when you don't understand, right? We as STEM folks, we all know that there are, there are times where we will not understand what's in front of us, right? STEM is hard. <laughs> Um, there's times where even now when I'm talking to my colleagues, I'm not sure what they're talking about. So what do I do when I when I don't understand? I ask them, right? And that's okay. And there's an there's an understanding within STEM that if I don't understand something, I'm going to ask and I'm going to clarify what I don't understand. But a lot of our students don't know that. There's this hidden curriculum around what do you do when you don't when you're not 100% there. So that's what we're talking about with cultural capital, really trying to build the skills that the students need to succeed in STEM long term. Um, so one um we talked a little bit about this in introductions, but there are both informal and formal mentorships. And it's been shown that both of these are important for students. So an informal mentorship, I'm sure we all have participated in these mentorship type relationships. It forms spontaneously based on mutual interests, based on mutual qualities, um, just that personal connection that you feel with your students, right? So some students automatically feel comfortable with you and they're willing to share and they're willing to um, ask you for advice. Formal mentorships are relationships that are um, like are structured in an environment. So we have a designated person that serves the mentor role, a designated person that serves the mentee role. These are the mentors and mentees typically are assigned to each other and the structure is organiz organizationally supported. So um, as I said, both informal and formal mentorship benefits um, students and they're often complimentary. And I kind of just want to get a sense from people. How many how many of us have participated in formal mentorship programs? So if you could just raise your hand or put in the chat. So a few, there's not, okay. okay. So maybe 20, 20, I'll say 30% of, of us. How many of us feel like we're, we've participated in informal mentoring relationships within, I'm just gonna say within the past year, how many of us feel like we've participated in informal um, relationships? Yeah, of course, right? So this is true. Informal relationships, they're forming all of the time um, and they form based on just personal connections that you have with your students or with your colleagues. Um, what, I, what we wanna talk about today though, is the fact that members who are from underrepresented groups or um, traditionally marginalized communities, they have a more difficult time accessing that informal mentorship structure. They don't really know how to go about finding those mentors, or how to approach us and say, I'd really like somebody to help me out. Or they maybe they don't even know that they need that mentorship part of, of STEM, right? STEM relies heavily on mentorship throughout your education. Once you get a job, typically there you have mentors throughout your STEM education. But a lot of our underrepresented populations might not even know that that's part of our hidden curriculum. Um, so, Again, one of our goals today is just to convince you that these formal mentorship structures are important because they, they open the door for people who aren't necessarily seeking out that, that sort of support and maybe don't even know that that sort of support would benefit them. Um, so 
I promise we'll talk again in a second. Um, we'll give you a chance to, to um, talk again in a second. But I wanted to, before we get any further, I wanted to explain our attempt at a formal mentorship program. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm the PI for our STEM um, grant from the NSF, the grant numbers at the bottom there. Um, one of the major parts of the STEM program is, is mentorship. So our STEM grant is focused on getting students to the next level. Mostly that means getting them to transfer out to a four-year school because we teach STEM and the vast majority of STEM fields as we define them at our college um, are, are transferred programs, how we've defined our STEM majors. We do that by giving, by helping to provide four different types of capital. So the first one is financial capital. Our students all get a scholarship and that's really important as we all know, if they um, have more money, they can work less, they can spend more time on school. So we give them a, a scholarship that amounts to $5,000 a year over two years. Um, we give them academic capital. So I saw a few of our participants here are MESA program directors. All of our students are part of our amazing MESA program. Um, so with the MESA program, they get a lot of academic um, support. They get to be in classes with each other. They get um, academic excellence workshops. They really get a lot of academic support. And then they also get social um, capital along with that. So social capital is just having connections within your um, feel. So they get to know each other, each other, and they get to know other STEM students. The last part is that cultural capital I'm, that I was talking about. So we're trying to provide cultural capital for our students by, sorry, <laughs> excuse me, by placing them in these mentoring relationships and helping them to, to develop what, develop their STEM identity, to, to understand what it is to be a STEM professional and what they need to do to, to develop that. Um, yeah, I'll stop. So Gilbert. Or Brand maybe Brandy was first. Was Brandy first? No. <laughs> oh, you raised your hands for the other thing. Um, yeah. So th so this is our attempt at a formal mentorship program. Um so um before we go much further, we wanna talk about what are some characteristics of effective mentorship? So we've all, many of us have participated in mentorship, but um, how can we be good or better mentors? So we have some questions and I'm gonna pass it off to Teresa here. So whatever capacity you have, you know, whatever capacity you have acted as a mentor, uh, we wanna hear from you because we really all learn from each other uh, so, you know, the three of us have talked with each other about these things, and now we want to open up the discussion to you. So what are some expectations that mentors have for mentees? And I would add, do your mentees know what those expectations are? Because I think that's really important. We can't assume or expect. They may not have ever been introduced to this kind of um, relationship before. What are some expectations that the mentees might have for us mentors? Are we aware of those? How do we establish those shared expectations for a mentoring relationship? Um, you know, what does it rely on? What do we discuss with each other? Does anyone have a contract, a mentor-mentee contract? Have you thought about that? And most importantly is as mentors, as people who care about people, care about growing these students, um, how can we create safe, inclusive environments where those students, especially from marginalized communities, can come in and feel like they belong? and they can thrive. And so um, what I'd like to do is have you think about these topics or something else comes to mind, that's good too. And we'd like to hear from you. So if you could raise a hand, I'll just kind of go in order of how they pop up on my screen. And um, please share your thoughts. Okay, somebody come on, be brave. 
We're not all students here, right? Yay, go Gilbert. Oh, uh, I'm coming from uh, Bakersfield College in uh, the Central Valley. Uh, at BC, we also have a MESA program and uh, we have uh, an NSF uh, sponsored uh, uh, initiative to increase the, the number of stu students that we take into our MESA program because uh, we have about 800 STEM majors on average each year, the last five years, and we are only able to send out 150 of those students after two and a half, three years, and 45 to 50% of those STEM majors are MESA students. So you see that without MESA, <laughs> looks like we'll be doing nothing here. Many of us will be out of work. So uh, our our program involves a lot of uh, student mentoring, and uh, we have a PAL program where uh, STEM faculty recommend students who took their classes and did well in their classes to uh, to serve as a peer assisted uh, learning uh, assistants, and uh, those students are encouraged to those those uh, those PALs. We call them PALs. They are encouraged to sit in our classes and then outside class they can then tutor and uh, and mentor the current students in our classes so uh, as far as some of the expectations that i think mentors have of mentees i think we we expect the mentees to uh, uh to come to us uh but we also do encourage mentors to uh, proactively reach out to to the mentees so that they can meet and find, uh, discuss students' progress and, uh, and uh, find out other things that, that might be affecting their learning that may not be directly related to the college. Uh, some of our students have a basic needs concerns and some of them struggle with transportation and uh, only when the mentor is aware of those uh, difficulties and barriers can the mentor recommend uh, recommend the mentees to appropriate resources. So it is important that both the mentee and the mentor make every effort to meet as regularly as possible. Uh, I may continue to speak, but I'll allow others to, to jump in. Who's my next brave person who's gonna share some thoughts? We know what we do at College of the Kenyans and we want to learn from you. Um, I I only do informal stuff. Um, but what I sometimes do when a student is struggling and they're willing to come to office hours or have some kind of meeting with me, I kind of, um, like if it is something very simple, like they want an extension on something and I do that, that's different. But if they say that they were struggling with the concept and they want to understand it, then I kind of go over the concept, make sure they, you know, they think they understand it and all that. Then sometimes I'll be like, okay, check in with me like a week from now and you go over it again and you will have to explain it to me and I want to see how you're doing with that. And sometimes I have, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing like for these students, um, I think like having that sort of accountability thing a little bit. Uh, I think some students have said it has really helped. I haven't kept any formal data on it, but um, my professors had done that for me. So um, I kind of took that sort of like a tool in my toolbox. Thank you. And I and uh, you know, so we've had two people now who've who've mentioned the importance of that regular contact, that not just the one time, but repeated contact. So Teresa, who spells your name correctly, like me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I have mentored and I've been a mentee. And I think that, you know, it is important that you meet regularly, but also Sometimes what your um, mentee is learning are some of the things that you might not think that they're learning. They're always watching when they're around you. And I've had students come to me later on and tell me 
things that they learned from me when I didn't know I was showing that to them. And I just want to bring that up. Sometimes some of the things that you do as a mentor, you don't expect the mentee to pick up on, but they do. And one of the things they told me that I did was they said I had a calming voice and that when they would talk to me, I would listen. I would really listen. And they told me that that's something that they were going to start doing in the future. And also having a bit more compassion and, and things like that. I, I didn't know I was demonstrating that. Thank you so much. And you're right. They are always watching us, even when we are not aware. So um, let's see. Next on my screen is Brandy. Brandy, go ahead. Share your thoughts. Uh, I just want to share a little bit. Sorry, it looks like I muted. I uh, wanted to share a little bit about what we're doing here on our campus. Uh, we have a NSF grant and we have a group of STEM scholars who are uh, cohorted. So they're going through the same two classes together in the semester and they are assigned a faculty mentor. Um, and so, you know, we are encouraging them to meet every couple of weeks with their faculty mentors. Um, and, you know, there's a contract involved. We attempted to launch a peer program, a peer mentoring program for those students who um, were not part of the NSF grant program. And we've been sort of struggling with the frequency of, uh, of meeting times. Um, student schedules are conflicting, um, but we're also finding that they're far more, they're very quick to meet with their faculty they're very much uh, less excited about meeting with the peers. And we're trying to figure out how to shift that uh, culture so that our peer mentors are as effective as our faculty, or not as effective, but as they are effective. Interesting. That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so Maddie, what, um, what do you have to bring to us? Hi, um, so I can share a little bit from the mentee perspective. I haven't really been a mentor before, um, but when I was a mentee during undergrad, um, I signed up for a program where they would assign you with a mentor. So it was a really highly structured thing. It didn't really um, come about organically, um, which it was really nice to have that structure, but um, part of the Thing that I think this first question here is getting at about like the expectations between mentors and mentees was um, when I signed up for this program it would they left it very open-ended kind of like this mentor can almost like do anything for you um, like academic or career mentoring um, and it was really undefined and so I kind of struggled with that as a mentee of like knowing like what was the purpose of this mentor-mentee relationship um, so I think it's very important to have those like really clearly defined expectations between the mentor and mentee just to avoid any of that like confusion that comes about. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you so much, Maddie. Yeah, you know, we might think that by leaving it open-ended that then they come to us for anything, but they may not know what to come to us um, about. So that that's a really nice thing that you brought up. Thank you. Liz, we want to hear from you. Oh, one of the things that I have found that works out well when I'm beginning to work with students is that I try to meet in a very equal space. So I usually people come up, I usually try to have office hours in the lab that they've just gotten out of. And basically we just sit down at the tables across from each other. And it's, we have this rather loose, it was like a no stress environment, I think. And they tend to open up a little bit more about what, what we want to do, this type of thing. But I think besides listening, actively listening is having a friendly space to work in, non-threatening space. Yeah, that, that's what I was calling the safe space. When you create that safe atmosphere, you can learn more about each other. 
And, um, and that's very valuable. It's very valuable for the mentors as well as the mentees. So um, anyone else have thoughts on this? All right, I'm gonna throw another one out there. Well, actually, I, I do um, that safe space. I do office hours at the tutoring center and I try and get the students into groups and that really makes everything even and then they can work in a group on their own and then but then i'm still there um if they need to share and that's worked extremely well thank you laura thank you so much for jumping in i appreciate that and Jeannie, you have something to share with us go for it well i was just so inspired um by i think what it was Teresa said about how we are holistically mentoring in ways that we don't even know. And I wanted to share one of um, my fun experiences. So I, I'd kind of busted my leg and I was hobbling around on crutches, um, going up steps and arriving to my meetings with um, mentees, very sweaty and looking pretty horrible. And one of my mentees um, said to me one time, you know, the best thing I learned from you is to never give up. Even when you're an old person, you can crutch up the stairs and get to the meetings on time. So, you know, I thought that was pretty cute. Yeah. So a couple of things that, um, other things I wanna throw out there is um, for you to think about is, how do we know whether mentees needs are being met? And, um, you know, do, do men, how do mentees see us? You, we, we talked about, we had someone talk about that um, they're always watching us, right? But do they see us as the, prof the professor or do they see us as another human with feelings and needs as well? So a couple of other things for, for you to consider and, and maybe talk about is how do we know if mentees needs are being met, met and how do we possibly convey our needs as a human to our mentees in, in a positive way? Any thoughts on either of those? Go ahead, Maribel. Hello, everyone. I'm a, a counselor at um, El Camino College, and I'm one of the Puente program counselors. Um, so one of the things that we do, because we do have an organized um, mentor component as part of our program, um, and one of the things that we do is, one, is to get them ready for mentorship, because I think it has to be a training, not only for the mentors, but also for the students. That's, I think, very important um, because a lot of them don't know what a mentor is. Um, they're coming in, especially in terms of our program, they're first generation, uh, mostly Latino students. Uh, so they really don't know the concept of a mentor. So really training the students, but also kind of, you know, having a training for our mentors so that they know where these students are coming from and what kind of needs these students are going to have. I think it's very important um, <clears throat> to get them ready for that. And then afterwards, what we do is kind of have a discussion with the students and also at the same time with the mentors to kind of keep up seeing what, you know, what are the needs, what are things that they might need from us. A lot of times, sometimes um, they have, um, maybe the student shared, you know, that they're dealing with something, but they didn't share with us. And then um, now we're like, oh, okay, you know, like this is what we can do for the student and kind of implement that for the student and kind of have, you know, that one-on-one -on -one talk. But then also on the student side, kind of learning a little bit more that um, they share like, well, you know, my mentor, you know, like it wasn't this discussion or I thought this was going to happen. And then that's an important piece for us to educate them. Okay, well, remember, what is a mentor? What are the different aspects in terms of the mentor? They're a human being, you know, like they might have time. Do they have family? So kind of thinking of those things and also I think educating the student because um, I think that's what um, I forgot her name, uh, Maddie shared. I believe, um, 
that, you know, like it wasn't organized. So I do think that it's very important to have it organized because the students don't know and keeping up with um, the students as well as the mentors, but it is a lot of work, I think, in terms of doing, you know, like a program or something very, very organized as well. But that has been my, my tidbit about that. No, thank you so much. Um, I think the training on both sides is very important because you're right. I don't think mentees always have realistic expectations because us mentors <laughs> have a lot on our shoulders and, uh, you know, that, that we do play a role, but we can't do everything. And also as, as a mentor, Wow, you know, there's so many things after having taken students to NASA site for eight years that I wish I had had some training before I started doing that because I ended up having to learn as I went. And um, so I'll share a story with you because another thing we need to think about is how do we... Um, you know, how do we handle if, uh, how do we handle as mentors if we have a student who has an issue, for lack of a better way to say it? So I'll give you a couple of examples and then maybe you have examples and then how did you handle it? Because a lot of times as the mentor, we are the first person of contact and we're not always ready for it. And so, you know, for example, I had a, a student mentee call me up late one night and said, oh my goodness, I just hit someone who was in the middle of the street with my car. It was dark. There was no crosswalk or anything. The police are coming. I just had to talk to someone. And so... I just listened and I said, you, you know, first I was like, you did the right thing. Good job calling the police and staying there. But the thing was, this is 1130 on a Friday night. This is a black man who has accidentally hit a homeless person and he didn't know who else to call and he was terrified. So speaking of our marginalized students, our underrepresented students, we have to think about, you know, what kinds of things might they go through that we have not gone through? And do we have training for that? So um, you know, I'm sure we all have those, you know, stories of difficulties or stories of things that have happened where our students have reached out to us, but that's part of that relationship. They, tr that student trusted me and called me at 11.30 on a Friday. So sometimes we play roles that we're not expecting to play, but especially if we're targeting those marginalized, um, underrepresented students in STEM, there are things that may occur that we may never have experienced. So I really, really like you talking about the need for training. You know, as mentors, we need to know how to positively handle these kinds of situations and not just have to learn on the go. Um, I'm going to address that at Hartnell. Um, and it basically takes a village because to get that kind of training may take years and years. So we have 24-7 um, place where students can call. Um, if they have any issues. Uh, we have a student success mentor and I work as a team with that mentor and we talk regularly and then we connect. And again, she's got years and years of experience. Um, we have what's called a bit ticket, behavioral interventional program. And so I can um, go to counselors that are on site um, the student can get counseling, emergency counseling right away. So I don't think we necessarily have to do it all, but I think we have to have a team uh, set up at our colleges so that we can work together um, to give the best service and support to students. 
Yes, Laura, I hear you and I agree. And so as mentors, knowing what those resources are, that's one of the um, ways that we can provide that cultural capital that, look, things are going to happen and there are resources out there. And maybe the students don't realize those resources are out there. But as the first person of contact, because we have a relationship, we can direct them where they need to, you know, direct them to the BIT team, direct them to the on-site counseling or that phone number. Hey, if you need to talk to someone some more and I'm not answering my phone because I'm sleeping, here's another phone number. Call them and take care of yourself. So anyone else have thoughts? Oh, we have like one more minute and then I want to wrap this up. So do I have anybody else who wants to share a thought on those relationships between mentors and mentees? Um, I actually wanted to share something. Our college uh, at, for PDD this time, uh, it, the theme was mental health awareness and all that. And they gave us these little cards with QR codes that students can scan and find resources. And so on the homepage of Canvas, on the homepage of my of the courses, me and some other faculty, we just put, taking pictures of it and posted them and periodically remind them. So I hope that will be helpful. Oh, I am going to take that and run with it. I know exactly who I will be calling today and say, you know, all that information about everything that we have for students needs to be on a QR code. That is a very good point. Oh, we're going to have to make that change. I love it. <laughs> and that's why we all come together at these conferences, right? Is that we all have an opportunity to learn from each other, to learn you know, from people who have been mentees and things have been too open-ended and that creates a lot of confusion. And then that makes for, you don't really have a chance to build a relationship because things are not very efficient. Um, you know, talked about how important it is to know the resources so that when we have a student that is in trouble in some way, and we aren't, you know, we aren't psychologists, that we know who to direct them to, that there are a lot of models out there for mentor-mentee relationships, you know, including sometimes peer-to-peer -peer connections, which may work at one college, but not another, and including um, those informal moments during our office hours where we make sure that, okay, we're going to check in again in a week and we, we start establishing a pattern of behavior of creating that relationship. And um, I just want to thank you all again for everything that you shared. I was taking notes like crazy. That's why I kept looking down because, because there's so many great ideas that now I just want to do more. You've inspired me. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back. Oh, um, turn it to Jeannie now. Um, because Jeannie has a lot of experience mentoring on big projects as well. And Jeannie, go for it. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so I was thinking that what we could do is we could look at some of these effective mentor behaviors, and then we could share some things that we do that kind of align with these specific aspects. Because by dissecting it like that, it helps us understand as mentors um, where we may have some gaps. So um, I'm I'm getting this, we have this information from the science of effective mentorship in STEM. Um, and we've done some of this already, but let's look at it a little bit more closely. So first off, um, aligning expectations is very important. So mentors have to make their expectations very explicit and they have to create a safe space for mentees to make their expectations explicit. And then together in a bilateral, not a unilateral, in a bilateral engagement, the mentor and the mentee come together um, and, and they create a compact. They agree, they create something that they both feel comfortable with. 
And then of course, um, effective communication is the only way to get this done. Um, the mentor needs to practice active listening because the mentee needs to know that they are heard. Um, the mentor may have a different communication style than the mentee, and the mentor may have to adjust that communication style to make sure that communications can be effective. So it's important um, to be aware of that. And, and in terms of communication, what's incredibly important is timely, consistent, and constructive feedback. Um, so the more consistent feedback that we're giving to our mentees, the more supported they feel um, and the less likely they are to kind of pull back a little bit. Um, the next thing, cultivating trust is essential. Um, we have to respect their privacy. And I want to talk about this a little bit. It's already been mentioned, but we want to move away from the power imbalance. So when a mentee and a mentor come into a relationship together, sometimes there's this assumption that the mentee is supposed to automatically trust the mentor because the mentor has some kind of credentials, academic, career, et cetera, and that the mentee is the one that needs to cultivate trust. However, we both need to work on cultivating trust. That's, that's really critical. Um, and using every opportunity to do so um, is important. So um, I had an experience just the other day with um, one of my mentees. And um, so I was supposed to bring something and I had it in the backseat of my car. And um, this was critical for us to set up our experiment. And when I got to work, I reached to the back of my car and my bag wasn't there. And I thought, dang, I don't have that thing. And so I called my husband. And I said, do you know where my thing is? And he said, oh, yeah, I took your pack out of the car. I don't know why you left your pack in the car. So I came to our meeting without what I needed. And so what I did is I apologized to my student. I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm going to make this up to you. Um, because you need to trust me and, and I need to own up when I've done something um, that 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 set us back. And I also shared the story about my husband and how he takes the stuff out of my car. So I made it kind of fun and and brought her into my life um, without any expectations from her. So I think cultivating trust um, is very important. And for us to realize that 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 unspoken power dynamic is sometimes there and, and we have to work very hard to break that down. Um, addressing equity and, and inclusion. So mentors, we really need to affect on our own biases and assumptions that we bring to the relationship um, and how they may affect it and how our backgrounds may be so different. Um, so Teresa brought up a really good um, point and um, I know sometimes um, I've used this in situations where everything goes wrong um, with your mentee and, you know, your experiment blows up and, and, and the mentee will be observing you as you're problem solving, observing you as you try to figure out what goes on next. And I make sure when I'm talking about this kind of stuff, you know, about just moving forward and, you know, always, you know, just get those knees up and keep walking. I make sure to mention that this is an obstacle that is very easy to deal with. And we will get this through this together, but there are many obstacles that are very hard to deal with. So this obstacle doesn't necessarily equate with other obstacles that, that, that we deal with, like um, being unhoused or having transportation insecurity. So if we're, if we're clear with our mentees that, that we understand um, some of these issues, um, and that our particular experiences may not reflect those, I think that's an important conversation to add. And then fostering independence is important. Um, and one of the best ways to do this is to build our mentees' confidence um, and to acknowledge their contributions. And this is um, easier in some cases and harder in others. So it comes very naturally when we are mentoring students who are passionate about the same things that we're passionate about. Um, we might jump up and down and show a tremendous enthusiasm about something that we're excited about, 
where where mentors may need some reflection and additional support is maybe when we're not so um, knowledgeable about something or whether it's uh, maybe it's a little bit out of our realm of understanding to still provide that encouragement and motivation. And this is some time a place where peer mentoring can be incredibly effective. So I mentor my students in teams and they provide consistent feedback to one another. Um, they're, they're kind of tutored to provide positive feedback and also to provide suggestive feedback. Um, and I think that works really well because when they get the positive feedback, then they um, feel good about something and they want to pursue driving their own learning paths. Um, so what I'd like to do now, given that we have like these five characteristics, I'd like to hear from you where you do something that you think hits one of these. And so we can all learn from one another. Or maybe you're doing something that doesn't hit one of these that we haven't heard about yet. I just want to chime in and say that um, aligning expectations and and communicating, it's really important, I think, when we're thinking about our underrepresented populations, because, and I'd love for Liz to chime in about this too. I think a lot of times mentees don't even know what to expect from the relationship, right? They know that they potentially have heard that mentoring is a good thing and that having a mentor is a good thing. Um, but I've had students that I mentor in the past and they, they, um, ask me as if it's not expected that I could write them a letter of recommendation, right? If I'm your mentor, of course, I'm willing to write you a letter of recommendation, but they ask it as if it's like this big ask and they feel really shy about, you know, I, I know you're very busy and I know you fought, but, but, you know, as a mentor, I feel, I expect you to ask me that. <laughs> like, so I think just being very explicit about stuff helps bring people in that have been traditionally excluded because they just don't know the rules of the game. So um, I don't know that I, I, I'm working on aligning expectations, but I still don't have that compact that, that Jeannie was talking about. Galen? Hi, um, I just wanted to, uh, I really, cultivating trust is something that I think is like, it's one of my top things. And uh, one of, I, I think a lot about it and, and write about it too, uh, but the sharing of personal stories, um, I think it's a really powerful, um, a powerful tool uh, and connection with students. Um, I do think that uh, the way that I do it, uh, for instance, I, I work a lot around mental health with students um, and um, am very transparent about my own mental health, uh, which makes a big connection with many students. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also share my stories medicinally, as I say. <laughs> so, you know, it's like as they need it, then I share the stories, uh, not to overpower their own stories, but to kind of support that piece. And I think that's a real, you know, dance that we have that we need uh, that we always have to to do. Yeah, that's such a powerful point. Uh, Liz. Uh, one of the things when uh, I start talking to students and mentoring with students, I, I kind of share my story and kind of my background. So I let them know, you know, especially if they're first gen students, uh, my kind of generation of the siblings in my family, uh, we're first gen, so they're first gen to go to school. And I talk about how my dad was the uh, son of Italian immigrants, and they did not integrate into life. They immigrated to uh, Boston. And so they lived in their own little enclave. And my dad didn't speak English until he went to first grade. And they were also extremely poor. So I let them, you know, it's like I I worked hard, everybody worked hard. We had some issues. 
And I show a picture of my dad when he was a little kid with his mother and they had a neighbor who was busting up furniture to burn so they wouldn't get too cold at night. And they kind of look at me like, huh? Yeah, it's like, okay. And then I also share with them, I'm old enough now that uh, I was the only female in my chemistry classes and physics classes and stuff. And sometimes you would go to office hours where, especially this physics guy, and on his wall, and this is a long time ago, he had a dot matrix printout of a nude woman. And it was like, so I never went back. So I, I try to let them know that, you know, getting to where you are is in a straight line and you will run into problems, but if persevere just a little bit, it will work out. That's such a nice story to share with perspective, right? Both from the socioeconomic aspect and, you know, the the female perspective in science. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm I'm always particularly interested in addressing um, how our experiences can be different from the experiences of our mentees um, and and how to move through with that successfully. Um, so if anybody does have any stories they'd like to share, I, I would love to hear those because I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. I, I do think that um, when we're talking about it later, that group mentoring can be very helpful because there can be a lot of overlap when you have several mentors working together. And I think the peer mentoring can also um, help that a lot because again, we have a lot more people, so we have a lot more overlap. All right, then we can go on to the next slide. Um, so here, aligning expectations is so important as Maddie brought up and something that um, we may not always do in a very systematic way. Um, so one of the ways to do that is to actually develop a mentorship compact, um, which is a written agreement that actually outlines what these expectations are um, from both the mentor and the mentee. So I'm just curious, do any of you do mentorship compacts? Raise your hand if, if that's something that you do with your students. Okay, so we do have a few people that are already doing that, which is gonna be very informative. So, so what I'd like to do is just go to the next slide because I think that shows an example of a, 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 very, a very basic example of a mentorship contract, compact. Um, so of course the top thing is to include goals. Um, what you're hoping to achieve in the relationship um, whatever these may be. So maybe it's a general mentorship, maybe it's a project or a research men mentorship. Um, so it, it makes sense that we put down the goals. Um, and then the steps to achieving the goals, like this has already been mentioned many times, when are we gonna meet? You know, In my project mentorships, I we meet with my students every single week and every single week we check in and feedback is provided because I find that if we're not doing it every single week, we lose momentum. Um, so this is where we would put how, what, what are we going to be achieving each week or each two weeks? Who are we going to be working with? Um, confidentiality. This is, I think, a particularly powerful part of a compact. And I'm curious if anybody who does these compacts includes this. And I think this is one of the most powerful ways to create a safe zone. Like when you when you read this, it says any sensitive issues that we discuss will be held in the strictest of confidence. And you write down issues that are off limits for, for a mentee to be able to know that you they are completely able to set up their boundaries with you um, is, is a very freeing thing that will help cultivate trust. Um, and then of course, 
how will you plan for evaluating the effectiveness of the relationship, you know, in terms of a bilateral relationship? So how is the mentee going to be able to describe how it's working for them? And how is the mentor going to be able to provide feedback? And lastly, which is interesting, but also creates a real safe zone, is what is the termination clause in the relationship, right? That the mentee knows that they they are not bound. They may be bound to get their scholarship funds or whatever else they're getting, but they're not bound to you in any other way. So I would like to hear from the people who do a compact and share with us how you do that, because I think that's not what most of us are doing in this room. I know I saw a couple of hands up there. For myself, so, I currently, sorry. Go, <laughs> go ahead, ahead, Tania. Yeah, um, Tanya. And yeah, I will, um, I'll share about how we do it with the um, peer mentors. For us, we do it with peer mentors. So we do the agreement with them and we have, we do train them, the, the um, mentors ahead of time before they en start engaging with the mentees. Like I believe someone mentioned who works with Puente. Um, um, and uh, when we go over that with them, we go over with them the agreement that they should go over with their mentees. So that way there's a clear expectation. I think like someone mentioned, sometimes students don't know what a mentorship is. Um, so they, um, so going over that and explaining to them what the expectations are from either of them, because sometimes they're like, why isn't my mentor helping me with my homework? And we're like, they that's not the role that they're gonna be playing. Like we have tutors available for that, right? Um, and then we go um they talk about like the expectations, how often do you want to meet? One of the things that we didn't include on there that I um definitely will be adding is the confidentiality part. Um, because we we talk about that with them, but we don't have that in the agreement, which I think would be good to include for the mentors um, as a good reminder for them. Um, and yeah, so that's what we do. And then we have them go over once they meet with them. That's one of the first things that they do with their mentees is go over the agreement so that the clear expectations are set. Thank you, Tanya. That is a really nice format that you have. And it's encouraging to hear that that is kind of system wide. I like that. Um, Teresa, do you want to share yours? Yeah, you know, I don't have confidentiality in um, any of the agreements. We don't even talk about it um, in, you know, in the eight years that I've been mentoring students on these NASA projects. Um, what has occurred kind of organically is that by building that trust, the confidentiality just happens. But having it formalized might set up that safe space and that trust sooner. And so I really like that you call this out. You know, for example, I had experienced some uh, confusing and questionable behavior from a student. You know, one day they would be spot on, they'd be on top of everything. And then the next day, they were just acting very bizarre. And it's like I was working with another person. And eventually that student shared with me in confidence that they are bipolar and they struggle with it daily. And they're working very hard to learn how to manage it so they can be successful in STEM. And that helped me understand that student and how to interact with that student in a different way because they trusted me to that I would not betray that confidence. But that trust had to be there first. Mm -hmm. And so having this, you know, calling this out, the confidentiality early on in the mentor-mentee relationship, I think that could be huge. So I'm really happy that you have that there. 
Okay, well, let's go on to our next slide, which is talking about how to build a robust mentorship framework in community colleges. And we're gonna go to the next slide and look at some of the challenges. Um, so we face a lot of different challenges in community colleges. Um, and one of the challenges that we face is, you know, what, what's in it for the mentors? You know, um, we're clearly all here, so we know what's in it for us. Um, but why don't we have 5,000 people on this call, right? Why is not every single faculty member um, on our campuses doing mentoring? Um, so I think that's I think that's one of the challenges. Um, and and I think that sometimes part of that stems from the idea that um, there's just so many students, right? There's there's so many students that would would need to have mentoring. And how if faculty, are presented with 20 different students that all need mentoring, then how do you choose who you're going to work with? And sometimes if faculty have limited time and limited bandwidth, um, they may preferentially be selecting students that already have the cultural capital to be seeking that out, right? Um, the students that are already primed and ready for that. And so that creates an additional imbalance in our desires to try to achieve equity. So, so how how do we how do we deal with that? You know, how do we how do we move forward with that? Um, so, so I think that I think there's a lot of um, a lot of different things that that can be done to work towards this. And I think that that's what um, Trish is going to share with us because this has been a real interesting. Um, I, I'm I'm grateful to be part of this. It's it's been an interesting, evolving um, experiment to try to understand how how do we get beyond these things. Um, one of the things I do before I turn it over to Trisha is one of the things <laughs> I've been working on. And if anybody's interested, let me know. Um, so we do have um, an NSF um, funded RCN UBE to pay students to work on these internships. And then also it's internships on biodiversities and native bees for underrepresented students and to also pay faculty, right? So when, when faculty um, can get a stipend for the many, many, many additional hours of work that they do, um, that's encouraging. Um, we also have a, a specific research plan um, that we hand over to the faculty. Um, we give them a kit with all of the materials that they would need to implement it. So we try to really take away some of the barriers for new faculty um, who don't necessarily, didn't necessarily find themselves as mentor to make it easier to kind of like, you know, um, make it a smoother walkway to join us. So, so that's one of the things I've been involved in. Um, and it's been really, really incredible. We have a really nice network of faculty that are mentoring underrepresented students from a variety of community colleges. I saw Bakersfield here. We have two faculty that we're working with from Bakersfield Community College. Um, so that's one way that we've looked at, but then that's dependent on our grant support, right? And what happens when we don't have any grant support? So what are what are some more institutionalized ways um, to make this easier? And, and that way I'm gonna hand this over to Trisha. Yeah. Um I, I, so I agree with Jeannie. I think we've already talked about a few different um, barriers that we have. So one of them is our faculty are pulled in a thousand different directions. And um, because we don't at community colleges have research labs, we're not really, I don't want to say we're not getting anything out of it, but there's no like formal recognition for our mentoring efforts for the most part. Another one that we've talked about a lot today is that the students, when they come to us because they're brand new to college generally, they don't know what mentoring is, right? So we have, and I love the idea of having mentee training. We don't have mentee training, but I might um, connect with you later <laughs> to see what you do because I would love to have mentee training. Um, our mentors, we need, they need training too, but just fitting that into their busy schedule. So we're asking them to mentor students and now we want them to do training and mentorship too. So it's, um, that's one of the challenges they face, but I don't know, did, did we miss any challenges? I know many of you said you have formal structures of mentoring. Um, did we miss any of the challenges so far? Does anybody have a specific one that um, that I haven't mentioned yet? I think one of them that um, that our group 
um, have talked about among the mentors that we have in our program is what to do when your mentee kind of like falls off. Like they're not responding. They're, you know, not really coming to all the meetings anymore. What, what happens when your mentee starts to fade? What, what do people do? What do you all do? Yeah, I think I think that kind of does it fits a little bit into the um, like training the mentees. They don't know, right? Jeannie, what? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I feel like um, works really well is what my mentor did with me, um, my primary research mentor. Um, and I can tell a story later if we have time of how it turned out. It, it began as a horrible, horrible mentor mentee relationship and it evolved into a lovely one um, and what my mentor would do um, when I was struggling is they would do something with me physically like we would go together and work side by side um, on something and I think that when whether it's taking a walk or building something or sitting down and doing stats together or, or writing paragraphs together or working on a, a menti map together. If, 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 you, if you find that fall off and you make a particular time to meet with them and actually engage in side-by-side -side bilateral work um, or a physical experience like collecting, in my case, you know, we go and we collect arthropods and we identify the arthropods. Um, I think that can really help bring things back on track. We only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to jump. I don't want to, I don't want to miss like our punchline. Um, but um, much of what we've been talking about today is really focused on this mentor mentee dyad relationship. Um, and because that's familiar to all of us and because um that's really the, when people think of mentorship, that's really what they think of. That's how, what we thought of when we started developing our mentorship program too. Um, so in year one of our grant, we're in year two right now, but in year one of our grant, we set up these dyad relationships. So we recruited, I think last year we had 10 or 11 ment mentors and we had um, 23 students. And so we matched our mentors with our mentees. And we said, you're going to come together and you're going to do a project. You're going to work on a project together. Um, but we left it very loose, just like, um, I forgot I forgot who it was. It was a long time ago. Um, Marnie, maybe, um, was talking about earlier that it was very unstructured because we wanted to give the mentors and the mentees space to grow into the relationship. Um, but it kind of backfired. So we ended up having a few issues. So the first one is our mentee mentor assignments felt arbitrary. Most of our students in our program are engineering majors or computer science majors. Most of our mentors are chemistry professors or math professors, because that's what we have at community colleges, right? We have we have many others, but um, the majority were math and chemistry and our students most students aren't math and chemistry majors. Um, so they felt like we they didn't know why they were assigned to certain mentee mentors. Um, we had a couple mentors leave. And so those students just kind of were abandoned um, because they only had one mentor. We only made a connection with one, one faculty member. So when that faculty member left, they felt like they were just lost, like they were abandoned. Um, not all of our students, this is something we've learned, are ready to take on that project. So our we we want our students to do a project and present a poster at the end of the year. Um, but we learned that a lot of what our students need, we, we didn't ask, right? We didn't ask what they needed. And a lot of what they need is just very basic, like this is what STEM is. And this is what you need to do to be successful in your classes. They didn't need that extra one step above the classes. They just needed to know how to be successful in their classes. Um, and then our last major, major issue was that our students didn't connect with each other. So we had these dyad relationships. And so the mentors and the mentees met, but they the, the students didn't um, meet with each other. And as has been mentioned many, many times, peer mentoring is a critical part of um, success to our students, right? They really need um, somebody else there. So 
we wanted to know how can we do better. So we started looking through the literature, really trying to understand what what mentoring was and how we could structure it differently. Um, and this is this is where we started. We started with looking at different mentorship structures. The dyad structure is a very traditional structure. It's um, positive because for the most part, the mentors knew exactly what we were expecting from them. The mentees didn't necessarily, but the mentors knew. Um, it also allows for space for personalization and intimacy. So they can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And the contract we were just talking about is really focused on this dyad type relationship, right? You can tell me something and I will keep it confidential. Um, but, you know, we, it, we tried the dyad relationship and it didn't really work for us. There, some of the cons are what we talked about a, a moment ago. We're lit limited by the number of mentors because these relationships are really, really intense for both the mentee and the mentor. Our mentor said, I can take on two mentees, but I can't take on any more than that. I have too many other things to do. And so we really felt like as we, as our program grows, we're gonna be limited. Um, another issue, and this is, I think, especially important for our marginalized communities is that one mentor isn't gonna be able to address all of the different needs that our students have. So having more connections and having more um, mentors will help address some of the needs that our students have because not all of our students needs are academic and not all of our students needs are personal sometimes they need a, a mix of career advice and you know people who have shared life experiences and and people who have you know our students who are mothers probably want uh, might want faculty members who are mothers to also um, be able to talk to them about some of those issues um, and then, as Jeannie mentioned, there's this implied hierarchy that that limits interactions because the students are um, potentially assuming that the faculty are going to do like faculty are going to lead it, or maybe they just don't want to talk to us because there is this hierarchical relationship. Um, so we started looking at a couple of other. <laughs> <laughs> my slides aren't working. A couple of other different um, structures. So one of them was a triad structure. So it'll come back to it. Many of us are probably familiar with a triad structure because this happens in academic environments a lot where you have a, a lab head or a PI and then you have a graduate student or a postgraduate student and an undergraduate student. And the three of them work together and the undergraduate student has mentoring from both the faculty mentor and from the near peer um, mentor that has been working in the lab for longer or working on the research for longer. So they get kind of a dual relationship. This works well um, to counteract isolation as isolation and counteract imposter syndrome because we know a lot of our students come in with imposter syndrome. Um, but in our program, we decided to focus on group mentoring. So group mentoring is where you have two or more experienced mentors and several mentees. Um, and I'm just gonna go to the next slide. The reason why we like group mentoring is because it can shift the focus away from this mentor-centered um, approach where the student is working for the faculty mentor or the student is working around the faculty mentor's schedule. And it really promotes peer sharing and peer support. So in this group structure, all of the mentees and the mentors meet together as a team and they talk to each other. So what you can, what happens is the different peers, the different mentees are at different levels. And so they can participate in peer mentoring. They can grow their social equity. They can meet each other and learn about each other. And then for the mentors, they also get extra support because now there's two mentors in charge. If one mentor is overwhelmed and is not in charge, but two mentors that are participating in the group. So if one mentor is overwhelmed or can't meet that day, the other mentor can step up. So it, it provides a little bit more um, freedom for the mentors to have a little bit more space to meet their own needs, to have some mentoring, some peer mentoring that goes on within the mentors, and really to just create more community among our faculty and among our students. Um, so again, it can shift focus away from the mentor and focus more on the needs of the group. It counteracts isolationism because everyone meets together. Um, it prom promotes self-efficacy among the students because they can see each other doing, doing things. Um, 
they can build social capital and become empowered. And then I said this already, they can address mentor needs. Um, so we've been working with that approach so far this year. We have teams of two to three mentors and six to seven students, and we encourage them to meet in teams um, with as many faculty as they can, or as many people in the, in the meeting as they can. Um, one of the challenges of group mentoring is that everyone has busy schedules, so it is harder to find a time that everybody can meet. Um, with this approach, we have projects, but the students aren't expected necessarily to work on a project. So if they're not ready to work on the, a project, they can still come and be part of the, the mentorship team and participate with helping other students with their projects, or they can um, just learn about different academic supports. So that's that's the approach that we're taking this year. Um, but again, we're still new to this, so we would love to hear. I know we only have a couple minutes left, but we'd love to hear any advice or um, any any ways that people have made group mentoring or other mentoring structures work in their colleges. And I'm gonna go to the next slide just so we can. Um, these are our students and these are our amazing mentors. They're all faculty in STEM. No? All right, Teresa, I'm gonna go back to the last slide so you can remind everybody what our point is. <laughs> So, um, you know, what we hoped to have happened today, um, as we all uh, were looking to learn from each other, is to take a look at former mentorship programs, how to make them more accessible to students, um, especially those with limited cultural capital who may not understand what a mentorship is or how to even get a mentor. And, um, you know, and promote that equity among our student mentees, which is not the same as equal, you know, that we recognize that each of our student mentees have different abilities, different talents, different levels of, of social and cultural knowledge. Um, that the open communication, trust, uh, the expectations are made clear, all of that is so incredibly important for both the mentor and the mentee. It's important to both of us in that relationship for those experiences to be meaningful, uh, especially with most of us mentors volunteering our time. You know, why do we do it? Because it's so meaningful. And um, we're looking at a group mentorship model as a way to address some of the difficulties of the dyad and we're hoping that we see good results this year so keep your fingers crossed for us that this works in a very positive way for both the mentors and the mentees thank you okay and i believe you all are turning it over to me is that right trisha okay yeah all right, cool. All right. Thank you, everybody. So, oh my goodness. Um, just very, very quickly, um, just want to direct you all to uh, the chat where I have put the link to our keynote, which we were so excited about. And that's going to start at 1230. So again, our organizers were very thoughtful about your ability to move around, get a snack, you know, things like that. A lot of times things will just move from one thing to another, but they've given you those 15 minutes. Um, I believe that our uh, wonderful panel might also uh, be willing to stay after for a minute in case anybody has any questions. Is that right? Okay. You can stay for a couple of minutes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Just a couple so that you can also take care of yourselves. That's the whole thing, right? <laughs> All right, folks, uh, so again, uh, just take a look at that. We have the schedule and program, uh, but you can go ahead and I would probably just log into the webinar right now. And that way you can go away, get your snack, and then um, and then go back around the time when it's gonna start. All right, passing it Thank back you to all our so team. Much.